What's up guys? So I didn't plan on this video being as long as it is. So if you just came here for the Tynan match, I'll put timestamps ahead so you can jump forward. But if you have the time, I think you should stick around and watch the whole thing because it all gets tied together in the end. I spent a lot of time trimming off any stalemates they had, but I left in any transitions that affected the day. So you guys get to watch all the exciting stuff and skip all the boring stuff. If you do like the content and you want to thank me, just like the video, consider subscribing to the channel and I'll be happy. Also, I broke down Tynan in a previous video, so I'll put that on screen if you guys want to watch, and I hope you enjoy. So Jansen has four matches in the day. We'll go through all four, but I'll cut some of the fat off of it for you guys. One thing to really pay attention to, though, is how his demeanor changes as the day goes on. He gets more and more confident, and you can see by the finals, he's really feeling himself, and he's playing the game I imagine he plays in the gym. So notice how he kicks at the legs as soon as they engage. This is a good way to hedge your bets if you think your opponent might pull guard. If they are gonna pull guard, a lot of times it happens as soon as you engage. They get a grip and they immediately sit down. So kicking at their legs can do two things. It can either count as a takedown for you, so you kick their legs, they fall down, that counts as a takedown for you. Or what usually happens at a high level is this person's aware of it, so as you kick their legs, they won't sit down and it gives you one extra second to set up whatever move you wanna do. Now this switch he does is one of the most impressive fake guard pulls I've ever seen in my life. It's a common strategy to use to kind of fake the guard pull, turn it into a single leg and get an easy takedown out of it. But the way he sells it is what's impressive to me. He almost sits all the way down like a real guard pull and as soon as his butt hits, he switches his hips over and turns it into a single leg. It's really smooth. Now, I know how to wrestle for jujitsu a little bit, but I'm not a wrestler, so I'm not gonna teach you guys single legs. What I really want you to focus on is what happens as soon as they hit the ground. In my opinion, timing is one of the most important attributes you can develop in jujitsu, and it's not always fair. Some people wake up with amazing timing, some people have to work really hard to develop it, but I think it's something we should all be striving to get better at every day while we're training. The reason I bring up timing is once the match hits the ground, both people have a job. The person on top, their job is to get their grips and pass. The person on bottom, their job is to get their grips and set up a guard. But the grips unlock the timing for your next move. So if the person on bottom gets their grips, they're probably gonna set up a guard before you threaten to pass. If you're on top and you get your grips first, you're probably gonna threaten a pass before they're able to set up a guard. And you can apply this concept to gi or no gi. Just look at grips as control points and not necessarily grips on the material of the gi. Now you might be thinking, okay, that only applies when someone's not doing their job. And if we're focusing on high level athletes here, they're probably gonna be focusing on their job. Well, this comes back into the picture when someone decides they wanna change guards. So put yourself in Jansen's position here. He comes up on top, he has the control points that he wants to pass with, but what's preventing him from passing is his opponent's control points. So you'll see Jansen kind of threaten a pass here. And what it does is it makes his opponent let go of one of his grips and switch to a different guard. And in that moment, it brings back the scenario we talked about before where Jansen has his control points, his opponent doesn't, so now Jansen can blitz. Now these things often snowball in jiu-jitsu. You lose one grip, they pass your guard, you turn your back, they take your back, they choke you, and then the match is over and you just gave up seven points in one move, right? And it's nothing against his opponent. Anyone can make that mistake. A single grip at this level can change the whole trajectory of the match. Contrast that with someone who holds their grips way too long, lets someone pass their guard and they're still holding the sleeve grips. It's like that guy held his grips way too long. This guy might not have held his grips long enough. So you gotta find a balance there. The way he finishes the rear naked choke should be a lesson that your chin is not a sufficient choke defense. You can use it to kind of tuck and help assist with your hand fighting. But if someone's really squeezing your chin, they could one, break your jaw and Two, the choke is still gonna work. It doesn't really matter if your chin's in there too. If they have a really good squeeze, they can still push you to sleep with it. So he makes short work of match one and then he moves on to the quarterfinals in his next match. And remember what I was saying earlier, you're gonna start to see him open up and pick up his pace a little more and really start to have fun out there. So going into the second match, we see a similar approach as before. He gets his grips, he kicks at his opponent's legs just to prevent them from pulling guard right away, and then he can get into whatever game he wants to play. Now he pulls guard off of it, and this one's interesting to see because a lot of the stuff we talked about in the last match happens to him in this match. He misses one of his grip transitions and his opponent's able to blitz past him. Now to his credit, he does a good job of keeping contact with his opponent, following him whatever direction he goes, and eventually he sits up to his knee and resits back to a better guard. Now it's important to understand that a lot of people don't come back from what just happened there. For a lot of people, if they get hit with a big pass, they're gonna end up turning their back, exposing their neck and getting choked in the process. And from a competitor's perspective, it kind of makes sense to take that risk. If you give up a pass, you're giving your opponent three points. If you give up a back take, you're giving your opponent four points. But either way, your job's not gonna change much as the other person. Either way, you still have to recover guard, you still have to sweep them, and you still have to pass their guard in order to win that match. Now, earlier in the video, we brought up timing. This next sweep here is a really good one to understand the value of good timing. There's some sweeps in jiu-jitsu that you can get all your grips, you can get all your control, and you can force them. This is not one of them. This sweep only presents itself when your opponent's weight is off. A lot of us know the guard break his opponent's trying. For a lot of us, it was the very first move you learned at your very first class. It's the one where you grab the belt, you bring one knee into the middle of their butt, and you break on the opposite side. Well, there's a key detail to this move, and it's the way you lean your weight. 
The moment you bring your knee into the middle, you're giving up part of your base right there. So it's important that you lean to the opposite side in order to counter that. And the sweep that Jansen does, it's, it's hard to even call it a sweep because he's really just using his hips to knock his opponent over in that split second that his base is off. But that's where timing comes into the picture. So Jansen settles in on top, he gets his two points for the sweep, and then he immediately goes for a long step. Now we talked a lot about the long step in my Marcio Andre video, I'll put a link to it on screen. But to keep it simple, the long step isn't a pass that people often finish. It's usually the start of a chain. So people long step to undo some of their opponent's control points, and then they're able to chain passes off of it until they finish. And again, it's another example of the snowball effect. His opponent doesn't like the pass so he turns his back he ends up getting his back taken and it gets worse and worse and worse really quickly off of one mistake once Jansen settles in on the back he starts talking to the ref and I think his opponent's grabbing his fingers and my understanding of that is as long as they're grabbing all four fingers it's allowed that's why the ref doesn't do anything about it but you can see that talking to the ref almost bites him in the ass right here his opponent uses that as an opportunity to try to escape and it's really close but Jansen ends up taking the back again and this is where you start to see the power that Jansen has. It's one thing to watch a jacked Gordon Ryan one arm choke somebody. It's another thing entirely to watch someone at middleweight choke another middleweight with one arm. All right, so we'll get into the matches you came here for. And I think these matches really highlight why I think Jansen's gonna go on to be one of the greatest of all time. We're dealing with two world champions here and I'll be honest, Jansen makes it look kind of easy. Now I'm a big fan of going to good wrestlers to learn wrestling, going to judo black belts to learn good judo, but one of the things that we have that's unique to jiu-jitsu and you're only going to learn from someone who has a lot of experience in this sport is wrestling with grips and wrestling around submissions. Up until recently, it was pretty rare to see people who had both good guards and good takedowns. Most people fell into one category or the other, and when you did see someone who could do both, you got a guy like Lucas Lepre who went on to win for years and years at a time. Well, that's changed a lot recently. Now most people have decent guards and decent wrestling, so we're starting to see the gravity advantage play into it more, and people are looking for top position a lot more often. Now, to be clear, there is a strategic advantage to playing guard, and it's the reason why we see people rush there so much. To put it simply, it's just easier to score on bottom. It's easier to sweep someone for most people than it is to pass someone's guard. Where this gets flipped on its head is when you have two really athletic people going against each other because it's really hard to hold down an athletic person. If you try to sweep, a lot of times they'll just scramble out of bounds and you'll end up wrestling with them anyway. So for a lot of people, it's like might as well just skip a step and take them down from the feet. So again, Jansen uses his grips to set up a lot of the wrestling here. They scramble for a little bit, but Jansen ends up stabilizing on top and he ends up in this sort of 50-50 north-south hybrid position. Now Jansen's really good at navigating this north-south position. He ends up here a lot and we'll talk a little more about that later in the video. But to Ty's credit here, he quickly makes something out of nothing. I'm watching him go for this toehold. I'm like, all right, come on, man. What are you going to do with that? But quickly, he forces Jansen to roll and kind of bail on stabilizing. Now, maybe we have a different definition of what something is because technically he didn't have a way to stop Jansen from just rolling out of the submission. But the fact that he can find it in these weird, awkward positions, it really shows that these kids can find attacks from everywhere in the game. And the advantage he scores from the toehold doesn't feel like much, but it could have changed the whole outcome of this match. Right now, he's down two points and an advantage. So just by getting that, it allows him to at least tie the matchup if he's able to get a sweep or a takedown. Now, remember what I said about finishing a takedown or a sweep on an athletic person? Person, it can be a tall order, and if this isn't proof of just that, I don't know what is. Look at this, going right back to that single leg, and Jansen Gomez spinning! Look at that movement! <laughs> this is one of those moves people see at Worlds, and then they'll come to class on Monday and ask me to teach them the move, and I'm like, man, this is a, a level 99 athleticism move, and you're at about level 7 right now. <laughs> Remember earlier in the video, we talked about how you'll see athletic guys fighting for top position a little more because it's often really hard to sweep an athletic person. Well, this changes a little bit when someone has a lead because now Jansen can pull guard and he doesn't really have to sweep tie anymore. All he has to do is not get his guard pass. He's kind of in a position where if he does sweep, great, he'll have a bigger lead, but he doesn't need to. It's on tie to make up the point difference now. I think if you were to pull every single jiu-jitsu athlete and ask them to line their jobs up in order of difficulty there, I think for most people, it would look like not getting your guard passed as the easiest in the center it would be sweeping someone and then the most difficult job would be passing someone's guard. So your job as an athlete is to pick the path of least resistance. Why would you make your match harder than it needs to be? So Jansen uses his grips to elevate tie and then he turns it into a single leg. And again, these are movements that are specific to jiu-jitsu. You're never going to see these types of movements in wrestling. You're never going to see these types of movements in judo. You might see a single leg, you might see a sweep, but you're never going to see these things combined. Now, all these sweep attempts are adding up to more and more advantages. And remember, Jensen doesn't need to be doing this, right? He could run the clock out and still win this match, but it's just stacking up more advantages on top of it. So if Ty does sweep him, now he has this giant stack of advantages he also has to overcome. Now, Ty's aware of all this. So you can see at this point, he switches his approach from trying to close the point gap to trying to submit. And I think this is a good time to call an audible. In my last video, we talked about how sticking to the game plan is almost always the better approach. But to me, the mark of a really high level athlete is understanding when your game plan is no longer useful and switching to something else. But I'd say for newer people, if your coach gives you a game plan, trust it, they're probably more experienced than you. 
Something to note here is Ty looks tired. I've seen a ton of his matches and he has some of the best cardio in all of the sport. And to see the difference between the two of them at this point is a big statement on Jansen's cardio. He doesn't have a bead of sweat on him right now. And it would be one thing if Jansen was just trying to run the clock out, playing the safe game while Ty's attacking, 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 and then we see this difference in cardio. It's not that. Everything Jansen does is a legitimate threat. There's two types of attacks in jiu-jitsu. There's the one where you're just trying to reset the stall clock, and then there's the attack when you're actually trying to finish the move you're doing, and that's all Jansen does. We see Ty double grip the collar, looking for that Majid Hage style baseball choke, and it's a good Hail Mary if you're down on points like this, but this is a really dangerous move across the board. It's not just dangerous in the fact that you have to let your opponent pass your guard to do it, but it's dangerous in the fact that you have to commit both of your hands to their collar, so you're not undoing any of their control points, and they're free to grab you however they want, and most likely you're setting yourself up for a big passing chain. And you can see as soon as Ty moves one of those collar grips to something else, Jansen already has his control points and he's free to go. If you are going to play these like Hail Mary type games, you have to be ready to do damage control on whatever flurry of attacks they're going to throw at you after. And it seems like with Jansen, that flurry of attacks never ends until he lands in the position that he's going for. He's a walking example of the snowball effect that we've been talking about so much in this video. You make a single mistake and he makes you pay big for it. Even from the worst positions, you can see that Ty is still a threat. He could still end this fight at any point, but you have to keep in mind that he's putting himself in those vulnerable positions to attack. So if you're one of those people who like hates points and you only care about submissions, you have to keep in mind that getting a point lead can kind of help your cause. It forces your opponent to put themselves in vulnerable positions, which can lead to you getting a submission. At this point in the match, I'm trying to put myself in Jansen's shoes to figure out what's compelling him to still try to take Ty down because he absolutely doesn't need to. He could just run the clock out, take whatever penalties they're going to give him, and there just isn't enough time on the board for him to lose this match but I mean that's why I'm making YouTube videos and he's at the top of the podium right now I know a lot of really good competitors that will intentionally save energy for tougher matches later in the day and on one hand it's smart to be strategic like that but on the other hand it's really boring to watch and you can see that Jansen clearly doesn't have that mindset in him all the way until the bell rings he's throwing out consistent attacks all right we made it you fell for the clickbait you watched 10 extra minutes of my content and now here we are at the finals now, a lot of people were rightfully impressed when they saw Jensen beat Tynan, but I think a lot of those people don't understand that this is not the first time. Jensen also has a win over Tynan at Purple Belt. Now, if you've seen that match, you'll know that it was a ref decision, and we know how people feel about ref decisions. But personally, I think they're kind of necessary in these major tournaments, and if I was refing, I would have made the same call. So Tynan starts the match off by pulling guard, and a lot of the scenarios we talked about in this video aren't going to come up as much because Tynan's so good at all his grip transitions that all the windows he makes are really small. But I think it's a really good glimpse into how even at these high levels with really tiny windows, these guys can still get hit in transition if they're not careful. So Jansen backsteps into that north-south position that we talked about earlier, and this allows Tynan to turtle. Now this is important because it's the same way he takes the back in every other match. He circles to north-south, allows his opponent to turtle one way or the other, and then he circles to the opposite side. It looks flashy when he does it, but it's a relatively simple concept. I teach this move in the fundamental class all the time, and it just shows that even at the highest levels of the sport, it always circles back to the fundamentals. Both the videos I suggested earlier, my Marcio Andre video and my Tainan video, cover this position, so I don't want to beat a dead horse, but it's an awful position for the person on bottom. Okay, notice the position they're in when the reset happens. Jansen has an underhook, his head's down, he has really good pressure, his knee's on Tainan's stomach. Now look at where they get reset. It's 2023 in the finals of the world championships and IBJJF doesn't have a camera for the ref to see a before and after on the resets. I know you're not paying your athletes. Where's this money going? Now, if you don't know how big of a deal that underhook is, had that reset not happened, we may have seen Tainan get his guard pass for the very first time. It's that much of a game changer. It's not just the underhook that's the make or break for a pass. You can get an underhook sometimes and still not finish your pass. It's that combined with everything else, right? He has the underhook, he has his upper body down low and close to his opponent, and he has his knee already freed up and on their stomach. It's about as close to finishing the pass as you can be. So the bad reset doesn't shake him at all. He just goes right back to doing what he was doing. And again, this is another mark of a high level athlete. These guys control what they can control and they don't think about anything else. That stuff doesn't matter. I bring this up because I can't even count the amount of times I've seen someone get what they think is a bad call and then their mind just short circuits because of it and they lose the whole match. You have to just control the things you can control and the ref is not one of those things. So we end up in this single leg X position and the name of the game for Jansen here is keeping weight over Tynan. He needs to keep his weight on his front leg. So Tynan's going to be doing the opposite. He's going to be trying to push Jansen's weight onto that back leg so that he can stand up. Every time Tynan's attacking, Jansen's defending first, but then following up with attacks of his own. And this is really important because if you watch all of Tynan's matches, so many people fall into this trap of just defend, 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 and they get caught in this cycle of just getting steamrolled by him and they never throw any offense back. Well, Jansen's not falling for that trap. Every time he defends something, he quickly switches and breaks out of it and goes to the offense. 
it's a tug of war that's always happening in jiu-jitsu where one person's being offensive and if they get past a certain point and you keep trying to be offensive against it you're going to get caught in something so you have to understand defense to block their offense and then i have to get back on the offense to push them back now something to note in this match that's a little different than the previous matches i've seen of tainan is he's a little unsure of where he wants his grips in this match normally he's so pinpoint on where he puts his grips and a lot of times he'll literally keep the very first grip he gets till the end of the match and I don't know if this is something that Jansen's just doing really right or it's something Tynan's doing wrong, but he's constantly changing grips to different things in this match. And we talked about this earlier. Every time you move a grip, you're leaving that little window for someone to capitalize on. And I don't want that to come off like he's just throwing grips around and he doesn't know where to put them because he's clearly going for established systems. But even with those systems that we know work at a high level, if you're constantly changing between them, those windows are still going to be there. Watch how Jansen's using this grip on the pants to shut down a lot of Tynan's attacks. Now, this grip is not uncommon. You see it all the time when people are passing De La Hiva, you're always controlling that free leg but it works in a lot of different positions even like the double pull the way he's gripping it is a little different than people traditionally grip it a lot of people grip on top of the shin but he's gripping underneath the calf now it might not seem like a big difference but when you grip on top of the shin your opponent can lasso their foot put it on your bicep and push the grip off if you're gripping underneath their calf you can always push that foot off your bicep when they try to put the lasso on Okay, I'm gonna keep shilling all my videos to you guys. I broke this system down in my Marillo Santana video, so if you're interested in the double under stuff, go check that one out. I know I'm gonna trigger some people with this, but what I really like about the double under position is that it's an easy one to actively stall from the top. We have a lot of these positions on bottom, like 50-50, close guard, where you can run the clock out if you're up on points. And a lot of times this isn't even classified as stalling in the ref size because a lot of the things you need to do to maintain the position reset the stall timer. You know, the person on bottom walks their shoulders away, you gotta stack their pressure back up, so you are being active technically, but we all really know what's going on. So again, Jensen's using that pant grip to shut down a lot of Tynan's attacks. Every time Tynan tries to come up, he lifts that pant leg up and puts Tynan back on his back. Now, try to put yourself in Jansen's corner for this last 30 seconds because he's gone through the whole day without getting a single point scored on him. And this last 30 seconds, Tynan almost turns it around, but Jansen's able to stabilize and stay on top. And to be clear, that would have changed the whole outcome had Tynan finished this sweep. You know, I couldn't imagine being in Jansen's position, going through the whole day, no points scored on you, and then losing in the last 30 seconds. You would never forgive yourself for that. So Jansen goes on to win 2023 middleweight world champion. And I've been doing this sport for a long time. I competed for over a decade. So it's pretty rare you're going to show me something that really surprises me. But this truly shocked me. This is an amazing feat for Jansen. And he deserves every bit of credit he's getting for it. Maybe I'm just a horrible person. But there is something hilarious about them panning through the crowd after and seeing all the kids crying. I always love seeing the underdog win. And Jansen shouldn't even be called an underdog. He already has a win over Tynan. And that's kind of the point I'm trying to make. Jiu-Jitsu media often pushes forward certain athletes and they don't push forward other athletes. And it can be really frustrating, especially knowing how many high-level athletes are out there and they win and they still don't get the publicity as certain other guys. So go show Jansen some love. Go like and follow his social medias, all that good stuff because he really does deserve it. And like I said before, I really think he's going to go on to be one of the greatest of all time. So you should probably keep tabs on him. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate the support. A lot of work went into this video. It was the longest one I've made so far. So if you did get something from it, just consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. It really does help us grow. The other thing I wanted to talk about is how the community is coming together. I'm really happy with it. I'm reading all your comments in the comment section. And I see a lot of like critical minded people here. And that's the whole goal for me is I want critical minded people in this community that are holding me accountable, holding each other accountable. And I'm seeing a lot of that already. So just keep it up, guys. The last thing is I want to cap this off with Jansen's post-fight interview because it's really inspiring to me and I think you guys should all see it too. See you guys on the next one. How are you feeling today? Uh, man, I feel very good. I can't describe the emotion I'm feeling. <laughs> this, this was one of my biggest dreams in Jiu-Jitsu since, since I was six years old, seven. I was yellow belt. I was already dreaming to be black belt world champion. And now, like, I just conquered that. It, don't, don't, it, it, it doesn't feel real, you know? When you, like, uh, I was, like, uh, aiming from this, this title, like I say, from way back, like, 14 years, 14 years ago, you know? And now I become world champion. I'm very emotional, you know? Not just me, my dad, my brother, we always, always together. We come from the very bottom, from social project, you know. And now we, in USA, competing, like the World Championship, competing the final, get, uh, getting the gold, you know. I just feel like grateful, you know, blessed. Just have to thank God, you know, for everything he's doing in my life and my family life, you know. Uh, I just feel grateful for everyone that helped me to get here, you know, with a lot of people 
just for I get here the first time to compete now I'm here I have a sponsorship I have everybody sharing for me it was like a very big moment very special moment for me you know I, I cannot describe in your words you know but the, the, the guys know everybody knows that I'm very grateful for everyone you know. so of course You've won worlds at every single belt color, right? You were blue belt world champion, purple belt, brown belt, and now a black belt world champion. But that final was against Tynan, who hasn't lost in 70 matches. Did that feel extra special to beat somebody who was that dominant for so long? Uh, yeah, yeah, man, for sure. He was dominating like two years in a row, 6-0, uh, you know, no lose in the, in the black belt, IBJJF. For I, came, drop down weights, compete at middle heavy and beat him in the final. Of course, it was like a big thing because he was the main guys in the division, the main guy on the on the team, you know, he was winning everything. And to beat him was very uh, special too, because uh, it showed me that I am that too. I can go head to head with the best, you know. I just need to believe me. I know everything that I have inside me. I know my Jiu Jitsu. I have a lot of, I get a lot of power for where I come from, and I think this make me like do everything I do on the match. So you competed for the last couple of years at medium heavyweight division, but you dropped down to middle for the first time for Worlds, and you looked exceptional, right? It wasn't just the Tynan match, but the two matches yesterday, both submissions, had a great victory against Tyru Solo. Does middleweight feel like it's where you belong? Uh, maybe, maybe, boys. I was planning to do this, you know, I started and then I said ah, I'm not going to cut the weight because I usually don't don't cut a lot of weight, but it's like this it's sacrifice, you know. And now I see that the sacrifice that I was doing to to drop to middleweight pay off. I get here, get the gold, you know. But I don't know if we, I'm going to stay in this division. Maybe, maybe, maybe the big biggest one, you know. But we see, we see.